Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Community Council webinar sponsored by Adiona Therapeutics. Before we begin, if you could all please <sighs> remain on mute for the entirety of the presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. If you have any questions that haven't yet been submitted, please use the chat box and I will pose them during the Q&A. If we don't get to your question live today, we will follow up with an email. Let's introduce our wonderful panel and get started. First, presenting on our, the vital study, we have Dr. Jean Tang and Michael Amoroso. Dr. Tang is a professor of dermatology at Stanford University, whose research focuses on genetic skin diseases, including epidermolysis bullosa. She has led or co-led the research, the re, she's led or co-led the conduct and completion of six investigator-initiated clinical trials and is the principal investigator on the vital study. Michael Amoroso joined Abiona as senior vice president and Chief Commercial Officer earlier this year and has been newly appointed as Abiona's Chief Operating Officer, bringing over 20 years of product commercialization experience in the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries with a focus on cell and gene therapies. Next, covering EB wound care, we have Lisa Taylor, a seasoned RN at Stanford Children's Health who has worked in pediatrics for over 40 years. Since 2006, Lisa has worked with patients and families dealing with EB. Lisa uses a two-pronged approach of understanding her patients' needs and comforting the caregivers who are responsible for them. Today, Lisa uses her nearly 10 years of expertise in wound care and experience with EB101 to assist and provide guidance to EB patients and families. Lastly, Jody Gillen serves as the VP of Patient Advocacy and Clinical Affairs at Abiona. She serves as the main point of contact for advocacy groups and patients and families. Jody started her career in advocacy, hospitals and government, and transitioned to industry over two decades ago, holding various roles across development. Thank you to all of our presenters for joining us today. Here's a quick look at the agenda. <clears throat> we'll hear first from Abiona, um, from Michael about Abiona and EB101, and then the burden of RDEB and EB101 clinical studies both completed and ongoing from Dr. Tang. We have time for questions as well, so make sure to use the chat box. Next, we'll hear from Lisa and Jody on EB wound care and have another period for Q&A. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tang and Michael. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I guess good morning for the West Coast and um, good late morning. And um, hello to any of our friends we might have uh, across the pond in Europe. So it's uh, my great pleasure to be with you today, uh, the families, the healthcare community. Uh, my name is Michael Amoroso. I'm one of your executives at Aviona, and I'm incredibly proud to work within this community. Uh, Jody Gillen on our front lines, who I know interfaces um, with the, uh, the advocacy community on a, a regular basis, and to work with one of the most renowned institutions in the world in Stanford, and one of our foremost thought leaders with uh, Dr. Gene Tang. So thank you so much, my pleasure to be with you. I'll spend the first couple of moments here just telling you a little bit about the background of Abiona. Next please, Stephanie. Okay, so that's great. Our, our Safe Harbor Act, we, we will be talking about some forward-looking statements from the Safe Harbor Act. These, uh, these can change over time. Just wanted to make sure that uh, for any full disclosures on Safe Harbor Acts, you can find it on our investor relations of our website, so thank you. At Abiona, our mission is to work together to deliver gene and cell therapies for people impacted with serious disease. Our vision is to realize a world where cure is the new standard of care. And to do that, we have spent the last decade plus trying to harness the promises of genetic medicine, cell and gene therapy to transform the lives of patients and their family. Next please, Stephanie. Abiona is a fully integrated cell and gene therapy company. We have clinical capability. We are in pivotal trial with our EB program, which we'll talk about today in the vital trial. EB101 is the product. It's an autologous cell therapy gene product. We have some programs in uh, the San Filippo disease, which is a neurocognitive disease, gene therapy disorder, ultra rare for, uh, for children who are lacking. Um, uh, it's a lysosomal, lysosomal storage disease who are lacking a specific gene. Um, that is our programs two and three. We have some early science of our AIM CAPSID platform, working with our early scientists to characterize those programs further. And in Cleveland, about 70% of our employees are uh, out of the GMP manufacturing facility. 
this is folks from our CMC team, manufacturing, uh, process development, groups who help us take drug and make drug from clinical trial all the way through the ability to commercialize, working very, very closely with the FDA. Next, please, Stephanie. Today, our focus is on our EB101 program in recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. I know I don't need to tell this community about that. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about EB101 as I hand off to Gene to take you through the conduct of the trial. EB101 is obviously a pivotal program, phase three, now enrolling out of Stanford. EB101, the product with regulatory authorities around the world, and let me simplify this for the group who doesn't talk to regulators on a regular basis. When they feel your product could be a breakthrough for such an important unmet need, you're able to get certain designations that help expedite through the process, of course, with safe and, and efficacious data. So the EB program has garnered attention from our regulators around the world. FDA regenerative medicine advanced therapeutic, uh, advanced therapeutic designation. It's breakthrough therapy in FDA designations. In Europe, it has orphan medicinal product status, as well as what the FDA is orphan status. These are all important things, uh, important milestones to achieve as we move onward in our pivotal trial to bring it closer to the community in need. Next, please, Stephanie. You can build the rest of the slide, please, if you don't mind, Stephanie. Great, thank you. We're very excited that EB101, while there's been a dearth of op options in our deb in the last several years, EB101 targets and focuses on the underlying genetic cause of recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, namely the defect in collagen 7A1 gene. This, this, this gene leaves them unable to produce type 7 collagen, which helps anchor the dermis and the epidermal layers to the skin. In order to make these keratinocyte sheets, Two small biopsies are taken from non-afflicted body surface area of our patients, up to four potentially in the trial, but two to four. Patient skin cells are brought back to Cleveland. Keratinocytes are further separated out and they are transduced with a viral vector in order to introduce the type seven collagen gene. From there, these cells are now matured, brought up in a lab in Cleveland. The mature sheets, which take almost about a month, are then sent back to Stanford to Jean and her wonderful team, and they're ready for surgical application to the patient. A typical uh, yield of the EB101 sheets, just to, to get our minds around it, would be the size 40 centimeters squared per sheet, which is about the size a little bigger than a business card. We aim for about six sheets per surgical administration. Obviously, patient cells harvest there, there, there's variability of how each patient cells will harvest. So we don't always have six sheets, but that is what we try to aim and deliver on a, on a regular basis so we can cover as much of the afflicted area as possible. And then of course, producti production of type seven collagen following EB1 transplant can lead to the wound healing. We saw very, very exciting data in our phase one two, which was the premise of how we moved into Pivotal with the gene and team, as well as reductions in morbidity like pain and itch. Next, please, Stephanie. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to Jean, one of the foremost authorities in the world on recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, to tell you about the study, the current accrual, and to give more information to the community. Thank you, Jean. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I miss seeing you guys in person. I miss the Action for Jackson events. Um, and I'm grateful for Zoom and other things, but it's still not the same. I hope everybody is staying healthy and safe, and I can't wait to see you guys again. So um, next slide, please. Thank you for signing up um, and advance, please. This first slide describes the full burden of recessive dystrophic EB. We don't need to tell uh, the folks on this call about it, but who we need to tell is the FDA. Unfortunately, the FDA is used to people with one wound um, and their m goals for success are not in line uh, for what we would say would be successful for patients with RDEB. So some of our patients have been frustrated. Why have clinical trials taken so long in such a tough, devastating disease? Because we've had multiple conversations with the FDA to try to teach them about how significant our deb wounds are 
And it's incredibly frustrating for me to know kids uh, and how they're young adults. So I apologize that it's taken so long, but all of us are working hard together um, to try to teach the FDA and others how important this disease is. And so I'm, you know, this project and program has been a labor of love. Later on, you'll hear from Lisa Taylor, one of our experts in Arda wound care. She worked with Al Lane to help develop this program. And so we know so many of our RDEB patients are waiting for this. So thanks to Abiona, um, we have gathered data to really describe how significant these large chronic wounds are, the huge cost of it, and the humanistic burden it takes both on the patients and the families. For many of our families, you live it every day. We just needed to educate the world about how significant our deb is. Next slide, please, Stephanie. So what is EV101? It is an autologous skin graft. That means we take a biopsy from non-wounded skin, two small little biopsies about the size of a pencil eraser head. In the past, we took those biopsies, sent them to the Stanford lab, where Al Lane, Pete Marinkovich, and that group grew up the cells and made the business card size graphs to now sew them back on to chronic wounds. With the partnership with Abiona, we're so grateful for the millions of dollars of support that they poured into this program. So it's not just a small one-stop small shop at Stanford. And the hope is they built this huge GMP facility in Cleveland. We take the small biopsies, we ship into Cleveland and their huge staff of scientists work hard to manufacture and grow out the cells, take a virus to insert in that collagen seven gene and expand the cell. So now you have at least six business card size skin grafts. We take photographs of the wounds and importantly, we go for the big wounds where the patients really tell us there's a significant impact on my pain and, and on my itch from these wounds. The process from biopsy to the um, skin graft takes about 30 days. It takes that long to take little cells to grow them into sheets. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna show you some photos from the first seven patients treated in the phase one, two study. These patients were all adult patients. Uh, you can see on the photo, the baseline is at the beginning, you see a large wound on this patient's arm and this wound has been present for 10 plus years. On that arm, we put two of these EB101 skin grafts and you can see the wound has really closed up. In her elbow area, you see a wound that was not treated. And so, as you know, some of these wounds close but then reopen up. And what we've shown so far is with EB101, these large chronic wounds that never heal uh, can heal uh, with EB101. And there's a reduction in pain and itch. For a phase one, two study, the most important question to answer is, is it safe? and it is absolutely safe. In the seven patients with 42 wounds treated, we did not see immune reaction. We did not see squamous cell cancer. Um, we did not see any virus spreading out of those skin cells. Um, they didn't have any bad side effects. But the FDA requires us to now conduct a larger trial, um, a phase three trial, and I'll describe that some more. So, so far, the first seven patients, the wounds look good. The treatment is safe. We followed them for five years. And in subsequent biopsies of the skin grafts, we still see some of the collagen seven. Next slide, please. This is a close-up picture of a hand with a large wound. And you can see after the graft placement, three and six and 12 months, you see healing of the wound. The, the black photo shows a microscopic photo 
where you see a green line, which is the restoration or the return of collagen seven where it wasn't before. On the right hand of this slide, the green boxes just show you that each wound in this one particular patient, there were seven wounds, the wounds did quite well, that they were greater than 75% healed. Next slide, please. This graph shows you that 53% of the patients reported painful wounds, and you can see that graph goes down. So the pain on the EB101 treated sites go down. Next slide, please. So from these seven patients, we treated 42 wounds. And what this graph shows you is in the treated wounds, that is the navy uh, dark blue colored boxes, Many of the treated wounds reached a threshold of greater than 50% healing. That's the chart on the left, A. Many of the treated wounds reached greater than 75% healing. That's the B chart. The light blue color shows you the untreated wounds. And those untreated wounds, very little of them, if at all, reach those thresholds of 50 or 75% healing. So the take home message is in the first seven subjects, it looks like it's working, but we need to prove it out more. Again, these are large wounds and not small wounds. Next slide, please. So here we are. We need 10 to 15 patients to show the FDA that this could work for wound healing. This is a multi-center trial. The center that is open right now is Stanford. We've treated three subjects so far, so far all safe, and some results are very positive. We are looking to open more sites because we've heard from the community that travel is challenging, especially under COVID conditions. The study endpoints for this clinical trial is the proportion or the percentage of wounds that heal at three months compared to the control wounds. So what the FDA wants to see is to see match wounds. You got one wound here and one wound here. We can treat one wound with the EB101 graft. On the other side, it's left untreated. And we're comparing both sides to understand objectively, is there wound healing? Is that pain better? Is that itch better? Next slide, please. So what does it take to get involved? Um, you have to have RDEB age six or greater, and you have to have two chronic wounds that meet this size. And many of our patients do, uh, especially when you know they're age 10 or greater, unfortunately. The exclusion criteria are listed here. Next slide, please. Many of our patients already have had biopsies or genetic testing, if you haven't. We will provide that during the screening period. At um, day 26, you come in, we do a small biopsy and send it to Cleveland and Abiona to manufacture those gene therapy graphs. When they're ready, you come back and you receive general anesthesia. You go to sleep, just like you would do for an esophageal dilation or hand surgery and our wonderful plastic surgeons then sew up the grafts onto the identified chronic wounds. Then you come back, importantly, at three months for us to check if the wound healing is different between the treated and untreated sites, and you come back at six months. In between, you'll have some home nurse visits to make sure that you're taking care of the sites okay, and um, you know if you need treatment for any infections or anything like that. The important thing is we know that after COVID, travel is hard for everything. So Abiona is trying their best to reduce the number of visits. A lot of the phone calls and a lot of the clinic visits, like at six weeks, we've been IRB approved to do it remotely. In terms of travel, we've had three patients already on this trial and it all happened under COVID conditions. And we're so grateful that they were willing to travel with their family. So the study pays for you know, a first class or a business class ticket for the patient and their caregiver um, at Stanford. 
the COVID rate is incredibly low. We are all required to report to work, screening, testing, everybody is masked. When you come into the hospital, you'll also receive COVID testing too. And so far our patients have found that, you know, on the airplane and the airport, they felt comfortable. But no matter what, you know, we understand, you know, it takes work. Um, when you are here, we do our absolute best to take care of you. In the hospital, you have a private room. Mom or dad um, can stay with you or they can stay in a hotel. Lisa has trained the pediatric nurses to take care of these wounds. So for the first time ever, we had a patient who said to his mom, mom, you can go back to the hotel. I feel really comfortable. And so he was there for seven days and um, we did a good job of taking care of him. Travel is paid, transportation. We have a car service where we have a wonderful driver who's completely familiar with EB. Um, if you need a wheelchair, other things, food, all of that is paid as well. Next slide, please. So this summarizes some of the support and care. And if you have any questions, please do reach out to us because everybody's situation is, is, is different. Uh, what we try to do, um, Abiona works with a vendor where they prepay a card so it doesn't hit your credit card. So you have a loaded card where you can pay for certain transportation, food, incidental costs in the airport. Um, and we just make sure that um, you, know, you are taken care of. Um, we have our wound nurses. Lisa is there after the um, surgical placement of the grafts. You know, we'll do all the wound dressing changes um, and for sure, um, all of our patients felt like, you know, they were in a place where they knew um, about our Deb and people listened to them. Um, but contact us if you have any other questions as well. Next slide, please. So here's the Q&A. Um, I know Stephanie shared a number of questions uh, already with us um, and um, happy to jump into those questions or, or have others. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for sharing all this information. I know that patients are really excited to hear about this trial. You guys are first into the phase three and everybody's been, as you said earlier, Jean, waiting for this for a long time. So there's a lot of questions I have for Michael and Jean. The first being, are patients outside of the USA able to be considered for this trial? And if, should the FDA approve the treatment, will the treatment be made available outside of the United States? Sure, so I can start here and Jean, you can fill in the blanks. So I think we have seen um, an international uh, interest and, and presence potentially for this trial. So yes, and Jean can correct me or Jody anytime that I'm wrong, but yes, I know we're uh, screening patients internationally, um, number one. Number two, um, the first path for an approval to make this commercially available for patients and families in the community is in the United States through the FDA. Uh, this pathway will not will not bring us to an approval for, for example, Europe or Japanese uh, commercialization. We'll have to pursue a, another clinical pathway there for, for, uh, for approval in order to commercialize the drug. So our first priority has been to the United States. Patients could, of course, come here to be treated. Uh, they can come for the clinical trial, and then we'll, we'll continue to think about the life cycle management and try to bring it to other markets of the world. I think, um, you know, for the patients, uh, that have reached out to us um, that are international. Um, you know, we've worked with Stanford Hospital. They need to buy some sort of travel insurance, um, but um, all the costs of the clinical trial, the travel, the hotel, we will make whatever accommodations possible if necessary, if they stay out here for a month in between the biopsy and the eventual, you know, surgical placement of the grafts that's something that is possible as well. I wanted to speak briefly just because I've had a number of patients reach out and say, gosh, you know, when is this going to be available commercially? When can my doctor prescribe it? I think that's really hopeful and great, but, you know, we need to finish the phase three trial. And I don't mean to uh, place any guilt at all, but we require participation. So if our, our Deb community 
sits back and says, somebody else is going to do the trial and I'll wait for the commercialization and the approval. That's not going to happen. So I want to say thank you for all the participants and all the folks who are thinking about this because you are doing something for the community, something that many people may not have the time, the resources, maybe the anxiety to do. So all of our participants in any of the clinical trials, you're doing a huge, huge help uh, for this community. Great. Thank you. Um, and just to go off of that understanding that participation is necessary for these trials to move forward, do you have a timeline or a best estimate of when the treatment will be available to EB patients or when you want to file with the FDA? So I could take that one and I could tell, uh, speak to what we've talked about publicly, but I do want to reiterate Jean's point here. Um, the trial is dependent on how fast we have the accrual of patients, right? So I'll remind everybody that we're targeting 10 to 15 patients and about 30, uh, 30 pad chronic wounds at this time. Um, so again, the trial is dependent upon participants. I think Jean was clear that we've seen three patients so far, so we're waiting to enroll our fourth. As far as the estimate of when we could potentially uh, file a BLA, a biologics license agreement with the FDA for a review and then ultimately and hopefully an approval, uh, assuming safe and efficacious uh, our therapy proves to be, uh, we, we're looking at uh, late 2022 in the United States on the current estimations of our mapped out timelines right now. Again, that can always change based on the speed of patients coming into or the slowness of patients coming into the trial. And I just wanted to say that, you know, this program is focused on RDEB, but think about the potential future for other EB subtypes as well, okay? We're focused on RDEB because I think the chronic open wounds, the pictures, the FDA completely gets that, right? But there is work being done to teach them about other RDEB subtype or, or other EB subtypes like EB simplex. We might not have the large chronic wounds, but the blistering and the pain and the damage is still there. So as this program hopefully becomes successful, maybe someday there can be gene therapy approaches to other EB um, subtypes as well. Thank you. And to speak more on the types of wounds that you guys are able to treat uh, during the trial, are you able to treat internal wounds such as in the mouth and throat? Um, and also, can it be used on large wounds? I know you said that they're about six business card sized grafts. Could they be used on like one wound that's very large or do they have to be placed on different areas of the body? Yeah, I'm going to defer this to our clinical expert. Jean, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, we have treated patients where most of the back skin is gone, and we put those six uh, grafts on there and have seen wound healing. So yeah, we basically said we want to target the wounds that are the worst for the patient. Obviously, we're not going to put grafts on the buttock area because that's just a site for you know infection and um, hard to to protect. Unfortunately, the grafts are not able to be put in the mouth or internal esophageal area, um, but one day it would be great. Um, the next case to use this is maybe for hand surgery, right? So many of our patients get hand surgery and it'd be great to now, you know, uh, have grafts there so they can have uh, intact fingers. Um, so, but those are all in the future. The important thing is we got across the first boundary right now, the first goal post, which is to show the FDA how important these wounds are, what the pain and the itch scores are, and how healing at three months, at six months is clinically meaningful for our patients. Um, and while I ask these next few questions, I'm actually just going to advance to the next slide. So if any participants want to write down any of this important information from Abiona and uh, the study site at Stanford, you guys can get in touch using any of the information here. Um, the next question is, how does your treatment compare to the treatment received by the German patient that was cured via stem cell transplant? Yeah. Um, go ahead, oh, Jean. Go ahead, go ahead, Michael, please. 
No, I'll start off very briefly and just say, um, look, one thing that's important that we do is we don't speculate and compare therapies. Uh, I know Jean's uh, well-versed in the German patients, so I'll let her kind of walk you through that. Um, you know, right now I would say, look, we're in pioneer space. We're, we're investigational. Uh, we don't have treatments approved in RDEB today. Um, the keratinocyte sheet approach, uh, I think, is one that, that's novel, gene-correcting therapy. Uh, and right now we just it doesn't help us to speculate and compare. What I will do is turn it over to Gene so you guys have a little understanding of potentially the stem cell approach that was used in Germany. So Gene, please go ahead and feel free to correct me any anytime. Yeah, I believe the German patient had a junctional EB and the gene correction via stem cell um, harvest um, uh, was for the laminin gene and that patient was really, really sick. He was intubated for six months and that was almost like a huge, large surface area, 30% um, or greater of his skin transplanted, and then he was still intubated while he recovered. So my comment is wonderful in the sense that this is an example of gene therapy working. It's kind of hard to compare because we're comparing apples to oranges. His was junctional EB. What we're talking about is recessive dystrophic EB, and that was one patient and in this example, we're talking about seven patients, you know, followed very rigorously. Um, I hope one day we have a lot of different patients uh, and a lot of different um, approved drugs to help patients with large wounds, with small wounds, with recurring wounds. So may we all get there. Great. Um, have any of the patients that were in the phase one trial been treated again in for a second time anywhere on their body? Have they been coming back for the other phases of trial? I think that's a really good question. I think Abiona has been very, um, very careful, um, and we have not treated uh, again um, another patient just because we want to have more patients and show the FDA that you know we're not taking the same patient and rolling them in lots of different trials. I think there is discussion about when the phase three is, is done, if, if the phase three patient or a phase one, two patient wants retreatment, that's a different protocol, but we're not gonna take the same patient and, and double count them in different uh, trials. Great, um, and then concerning skin transplant, does this new improved skin treat only the patch that it was applied to or does it have an effect elsewhere on the body? Yeah, unfortunately what's transplanted is that um, graft. It doesn't unfortunately expand to other areas, um, but we try to target the worst wounds. And like I mentioned, once the phase three is done, then hopefully we can make more grafts and patch on other areas of wounding. Hey, Jean, could you speak a little bit to maybe some of the durability data we've showed from phase one and two? Uh, you know, we just showed in July at, at the Society of Pediatric Derm. I, I think it's important, um, you know, understanding that people are talking about a large surface area afflicted. I think how long we close wounds is, is vital too. Could we maybe give a little bit of a background on the phase one, two data, how long we've seen some wound closure and size of some wounds? Yeah, I mean, depending on where the wounds are, right, uh, especially on the extremities, on areas where there's not a lot of pressure, um, some of these wounds have healed for greater than two years, and the pain and the itch um, has significantly improved. We have one patient who basically says, you know, it used to take me an hour in the morning to try to get ready um, because there were so many painful oozing wounds on my back and we grafted her back and now she says, boy, I barely have to use any wound dressings there and this has transformed my life. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about just wound healing for a few months or less than a year. This patient is now onto year four. So um, obviously there's, you know, some differences in results if the graft maybe gets infected or maybe gets scratched on, or if there's a lot of friction and pressure on it, those results we think may not be as good, but if the graphs do take, you know, we've had some spectacular successes. Thank you. Jane, do you think that uh, getting back to the question that Stephanie asked, that when you uh, gene correct these keratinocyte sheets, that maybe you're also 
uh, correcting some stem cells that are long-lived stem cells that are continuing and maybe maybe dividing and providing other you know progeny that are also making type seven collagen. I mean, I know you're pretty limited, but I'm just this is more of a theoretical question. Yeah, David, that's has to be what's going on, right? If you're expecting wound healing, and then uh, so far out in matter of years, and in terms of the biopsies at year two after grafting, we still can detect collagen seven. That just means that in some of the biopsies um, that were taken to create these uh, gene therapy grafts, we must have taken some stem cells. The hope is maybe in pediatric patients, the graft and the wound healing is even better because they're a little bit more enriched for stem cells, but the truth is we don't know, but we have to be transducing some stem cells. Thanks, David. Thanks. Um, another question that just came through is what can be done to address enrollment as you guys are looking to recruit some more patients? And are there other sites proposed besides Stanford to deal with COVID travel problems? Yes, yeah, so I'll start. And then, uh, Jean, please feel free to weigh in. I'd like to get Jody to be able to speak on this a little bit. I, I think Jean started to speak about how we constantly assess the trial and what's going on in the world and think about how can we make this even more feasible for families. Of course, having in-person clinical visits to show the, uh, the, the progression and, and the, how, how the treatment's doing is, is very important when you're in a pivotal trial. So I think Jean's talked about how already we've tried to make some of the visits in totality that could potentially be virtual. Those are conversations we'll be having with the authorities. Jody, uh, I'll speak to the second site and then I'll turn it to Jody for a minute and Jean. Um, as far as a second site, I think ideally we would have a second site on the East Coast to try to make, you know, one end, just practically one end of each country to make it a little easier on families. I think we were close in New York City and then obviously some of the this year's events kicked in. So uh, while we feel that we can accrue the entire trial at Stanford, we would absolutely, we've been talking to a lot of the KOLs and David, good to see you. David and I had this conversation a few weeks ago. We do need some of the top academics. I'll take Gene's words before, we, we can't sit back and wait for someone else to do it. We really have to raise our hands and more importantly than just a clinical trial, if we are able to get this commercially uh, you know, approved, we're going to need more sites than Stanford just to treat the, the volume of patients around the country to become a standard of care. So I ask you if you are a physician on the line and potentially interested and have the right multidisciplinary team to please contact us, Jody and team, and, and we, we would love to talk to you if the capability is right for the center. Jody, can you speak a little bit to some of the augmentations we made with travel arrangements, um, seating arrangements on the plane? to try to make the patients more comfortable with the current situation of COVID? Sure. So starting on the travel arrangements, I know Jean presented quite a bit, but it's really been based on the comfort level of the patient and the family. So if that's a first class ticket on a plane and making sure that they have a road to themselves, um, that accommodation has been made or even you know, making sure that either the hotel is either in walking distance to a site or within 10 minutes, and then the family can either rent a car or arrange in advance to have a driver, and then they just have the one driver. So it's really minimizing the exposure and ensuring that there's a two-way conversation based on the comfort of the patient family. In terms of um, recruitment, I'll just share that in a disease like RDEB, it's really getting the word out to patients, caregivers, and clinicians. Um, so it's webinars such as these, showing data that we have to date, answering questions. So we've done it through Deborah, now EBRP, we'll do it through Pedro, through the clinicians, and then meeting with um, key opinion leaders and our, our Deb clinics and any physicians that work in our Deb, such as Dr. Woodley, who took the time to dial in today. So we're getting the direct referrals. Jean, anything to add on that? No, no. Okay, Stephanie. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question, if an EBP patient wants to be treated completely using this method, do they have to have a skin transplant done on their entire body? Jean, I'll send that to you, please. Yeah, so, you know, um, what we can do today is based on the prior data. So the phase one, two showed safety in six graphs. And that's what we're going to replicate in the phase three. Um, 
when we get questions of like, can't you just replace all of my skin? It's heartbreaking. And it's heartbreaking to hear a parent, patient, a patient's parents say, can't you take my skin and transplant it onto my child's skin? So, you know, it's, we, we get it. For the rules of the FDA, unfortunately, we have to stick to six wounds because they're concerned about uh, safety and objectivity. Um, once the phase three is done, then if the product is approved, then it's a discussion between you and your physician to say, guess what? Um, I'd, I'd like my back, uh, try to fit as many back uh, graphs. Uh, later on, I'd like my right leg, try to fit as many uh, graphs on my leg. You know, those are in the clinical parameters and I would love to see this um, used more widely because I get it, you know, we're only treating six sites, but that's where we need to start and that's where we need to prove out that it works. Great, thank you so much. So we, that's all the time we have for Q&A for this segment, but we're going to take all the questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to answer and we'll send you guys an email if you asked a question that we didn't get to. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Lisa Taylor and Jody for wound care tips and Q&A. Great, thank you, Stephanie. I'm absolutely thrilled that we have Lisa Taylor with us today. We're so incredibly fortunate. I know Michael will say that I'm on the front lines of Aviona because I have the privilege of working with patients, caregivers, and clinicians. Lisa is the front lines of Stanford's EB clinic. And as Jean says, she's their secret sauce. So what we did was compile questions that have come in to Lisa from patients and caregivers that might have only been responded to one family and really try and highlight that and bring all the information to the community. And we're gonna share additional resources after. So this is gonna be a quick fire Q and A because we wanna make sure we have 10 minutes left for general questions. So you can go to the next slide, please. So the first question, Lisa, at Stanford, what's the approach in caring for EB patients? Oh, thank you, Jody. Uh, this is a really great question to start with. And um, before I go on, I just want to take a moment to say thank you. And I appreciate this webinar opportunity to talk about wound care tips. Um, let's start at the beginning when a baby is born with EB. As we all know, the first few days and weeks of an EB child's life is a very stressful time and understandably an overwhelming time for parents and family. In general, it is helpful to have a precise diagnosis in order to inform the clinical decision-making process. Family medical history is very important along with clinical presentation of the child. Sometimes a skin biopsy is needed. Sometimes genetic studies are indicated. Sometimes a history of EB in the family can inform the diagnosis. Every child's EB diagnosis is unique as there is a spectrum of skin involvement within each of the EB diagnoses. It's very important that people and families do not feel like they are alone dealing with EB. Connection to their doctors and other families is really, really important. Online EB groups are an easy way to connect with other people challenged with EB. Uh, another topic that I'm really passionate about is self-care for the caregiver. You may remember last year, um, there was an excellent presentation about self-care during EB Awareness Week by um, one of our uh, Stanford PICU nurses, Andy Helgeson. We know that caring for a child with intense needs takes an emotional toll and physical toll on parents. The situation is extremely stressful. There are many strategies for self-care, but it's important that whatever you do, that it meets your needs. Focus on self-care where you're compassionate towards yourself, where you strengthen your relationships and where you renew your energy. Next slide, please. So, Lisa, this comes up because Stanford, you know, is one of the rare hospitals that has an EB clinic. And 
can you talk about who you need on your team? And then if you don't have access to an EB clinic, how do you formulate this team? And then I can always call it a quarterback. You know, who, who should be the lead? Right, that's another great question. It, it's really well known that with rare diseases like EB, parents take on an important role of not only caregiving for their child, but also being an important part of their child's health care team. We all know EB is not just a skin disorder. EB is a total body disease affecting the skin and other organs. Parents develop their own expertise from the day-to-day -day experiences of caring for their child. And this is an important part of the team relationship. The amount of physical involvement varies from one person to another. Our team has identified a multi-system approach to evalu evaluating EB patients. Here's a list of areas that need to be considered for your child's care. Um, and you could replicate it with some effort. I'll admit, admit that. Um, you know, if you don't have access uh, to uh, an EB center, there's only a handful of EB centers across the nation. But um, just sort of in a sort of alphabetical order, you know, dermatology, dental needs, gastroenterology, hand evaluations, hematology is really important, nutrition, occupational therapy, ophthalmology, physical therapy, pain management, psychology, and a social worker. Um, pediatricians, we often will work with pediatricians in the community um, to co help coordinate the child's care. You know, they can help with uh, monitoring uh, lab values and skin cultures, things like that. Next question, please, Jody. We have to talk about COVID and there's so many different facets to COVID. And I know the questions come up in general, are patients with RDEB at higher risk? And then not only in terms of like limiting of activities and what they can do and can't do, but I was surprised, Lisa, you even had tips about how to get the test and what patients need to think about. Yeah, um, I recommend that families familiarize themselves with the Deborah International website. Um, this is, uh, this image is taken from the website. It's a booklet that they've produced with a lot of really great suggestions on dealing with COVID. There's no evidence that people living with EB are at high risk to develop severe illness. However, some individuals with severe EB have other medical conditions that may affect the severity of a COVID illness if they're infected. Um, anyway, this, this online booklet has really great information. And then if your EB child is ever in the situation where they need to be tested for EB, what, what kind of things do you need to, to think about? Um, one thing is to think about what type of COVID testing will be done. Um, there's a deep nares test that uses a swab. There's a mid nares test that also uses a swab. There's an antibody test that uses a blood test. And there's a saliva PCR um, test. And these are all changing as um, our, we go along in time. So various types of tests have various types of risks. And patients with fragile skin um, need to, you need to consider what the risk is on to minimize the skin and mucosal injury. Uh, the deep nares is also known as the nasal pharyngeal swab, and that should definitely be avoided with EB kids. You don't wanna cause any blisters in the back of the throat. Um, the use of masks is becoming a standard for helping to prevent the spread. For masking uh, an EB child, use a soft mask that covers the nose and mouth. 
You could use a soft headband with buttons placed above the ears. And then you can loop the mask around the buttons instead of the ears to help uh, decrease friction around the ears. That's um, a, sort of a creative tip on uh, masking an EB child. That's great. Next slide, please. Okay, so I know we talk a lot about the burden of wound care, but in particular, Lisa, how can you reduce the cost? Yeah, that's a great question. I always tell families that what works for one EB child may not work for another EB child, even when the diagnosis is the same, like with an RDEB, there's still a range of how the disease affects people. Um, I always teach um, a three layer bandage system, which uses a contact layer that touches the skin. That's the first layer. Conform rolled gauze is the second layer, and elastic tubular gauze is the third layer to hold the bandages in place. And uh, families seem to use whatever works for them. It could be a single layer, it could be a double layer, it could be a, the, tr the three layer system. Um, it varies. So here's a few tips for reducing the cost. And, these tips sort of echo decades past wound care approach before the, the advanced wound care products were created. The first tip is that Vaseline ointment is less expensive than Aquaphor. Um, and it's an excellent product for skin. Um, the uh, second tip is that um, Vaseline gauze and surgical pads or Telfa pads are less expensive than advanced wound care products like the silicone dressings. Um, and then um, another idea is um, sometimes people will use nylon stockings instead of tubular gauze to help hold the bandages in place. And this is a good tip for staying cooler in the warmer climate, climates too. Then um, scissors can always be used and sanitized in between um, blister popping sessions. Um, and so that's another tip. Um, sometimes dermatologists recommend dilute bleach baths. And this is an inexpensive skin care treatment. Um, it should be uh, you should do it under the guidance of your, your dermatologist. So we have one last question before the open okay. Q&A. Great. And the last one is about nutrition. Uh, how do you get more calories to these patients? Well, we all know that nutrition is super important for the EB community. The daily caloric needs of an EB child are significant. Consulting a registered dietitian is immensely helpful for proper evaluation and recommendations for growth. There are a number of calorie dense products that people use. Um, some people prefer to create their own calorie dense foods. And I've included um, some recipes in the resource um, resources provided. Um, and then I think it's important to also just review um, some basic pediatric principles on around food. For example, um, you know, a parent's job is to provide food and to set limits. Also set a scheduled time when food is offered, like meal times or snack times. And then it's important to encourage children to self-feed and you never want to force feed or bribe for the last bites. Uh, let children be messy within reason. Um, when possible, have family meals and be a positive role model. Ch the child's job is to decide how much food they want to eat and um, whether or not they will eat. It's really um, their job. It helps to avoid power struggles. Um, 
I know dysphagia or trouble swallowing can be an acute or chronic challenge for EB kids. There are dysphagia, uh, dysfa dysphagia diet guidelines, and um, it looks at the liquid consistency and a registered dietitian can help parents as and establish an understanding of how to integrate this into their diet plan. I've also included a list of um, foods that you can focus on integrating that will help gain weight. Um, there's a list on the slide there. So Stephanie, as you collect questions, I'm not sure if any came through. Lisa actually was sending me countless resources. And the next few slides, we just highlighted the types of resources. And Stephanie from EBRP has kindly offered to share these via email uh, through everyone who signed up for today's webinar. So you can even go through the next slides just to see the resources that will be coming your way and feel free to send in your questions for Lisa at this stage. Oh, that's great. So the resource one is um, a pain and itch scale. You could, it's designed for pain, but itch is really closely aligned with pain. Um, and I, I like to use these um, pediatric friendly um, Wong Baker face pain rating scales. I think they're child friendly and they really help you communicate with your child about pain and itch. The reason I use pain and itch phrase together is because itch can be a significant problem. We all know that. And functionally, it can impact an EB patient's life and their family life. Itch, and I'll tell you why, itch sensations travel along the same neural pathways to the brain as pain sensations. And so it's important to recognize that this and to dialogue about the issue. The second pain scale, I like this one too, instead of going from zero, two, four, six, eight, it goes zero, one, two, three. And this sort of focuses in on the functional interference of pain um, for example, you know, how tolerable is the pain? Does it interfere with activities? Can they still watch TV and read? Or is it intoler intolerable and they're not able to watch TV? It just helps guide you to understanding um, how significant the pain is for your child. Um, the second resource that I always want people to know about is the Buyer's Door Free Aquaphor program. They'll, um, parents register for the program. Your doctor sends a letter to um, medically justify why you need the program. And the, the company will send you 12 jars or one case of Aquaphor every three months on the, on the program. Um, number three is um, informational cards that briefly explains what EB is, tells people it's not contagious. Um, it's sort of fun to tell people what you like to do. And then you can suggest that people can help by making a friend with someone who has EB, telling somebody about EB, or donating to the efforts to, to cure EB. Uh, resource number four is a silicone medical ID bracelet. Um, I think it sort of helps to validate the medical condition to other people that you casually might meet or maybe a phlebotomist doing a little procedure. I like this one because it has a side tag on it that says fragile skin. Um, Number five is a laboratory guideline I like to give to my patients before they go to the lab. Basically, um, it just informs the lab personnel what they need to know. It's really important to say gentle, 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 no tape on the skin, avoid friction, and remember to listen to the patient. That's super important. The next resource guide is um, online. It's uh, anesthesia OR preparation for adults with EB. Um, it gives guidelines on what needs to be done in advance before the day 
of the procedure of the surgery. There are certain items that you need to have access to. And so it, it's a thoughtful approach to taking care of kids in the OR. Basically avoid friction, eye protection, how do you monitor patients? And there's a website link on here. Then resource number seven is uh, we, we like to monitor heart function on our EB kids because uh, anemia can um, cause problems for the EB kids in their, their heart. And so how do you do that when you can't put sticky leads on a, a patient? So this is uh, guidelines for that. So I know we have two minutes left. Stephanie, I just want to check if any questions came in. If not, I know you're going to send out the resources. And I know Lisa has a poem to close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we had a couple come in. Um, one question is, are you aware of any EB patients who did contract COVID and how they handled it? Um, well, just a minute. Looks like I lost my connection. Hang on. We sorry about hear that. You. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, not I. I have. I'm not aware of any patients contracting COVID firsthand. I don't have any awareness of that. I recently talked to a family whose the parents contracted COVID, um, and they did okay. Thanks. And are you aware of any new developments that could help EB patients while waiting for an effective treatment? For, is this in regards to COVID or? No, just um, wound healing. Oh, wound healing. Well, I'm a wound care nurse and I really like some of the advanced wound care products. The, I call it the thin, and fo the thin foam dressing. I really like that. I think it really, um, it's important to have products that don't damage the skin when you take them off. And um, the thin foamy dressings are really good at that. If there's anything that's sticking, all you have to do is wet it and then it releases. So it's, it's a huge advance for taking care of EB kids. That's great. Um, and now I think we're coming up on our time, but I will share all of these resources via email with everybody on the call who registered. Um, and Lisa, did I hear that you had something to close with? She has this uh, uh, okay. slide that's a poem. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I often talk about the ABCs of EB wound care. And um, in honor of EB Awareness Week, I, I did just an ABC thought about, um, I wanted to share. A is for all the amazing children and families afflicted with EB. B is for the blessing and inspiration of EB kids in our lives. C is for a cure someday, and until then, courage every minute. D is for discovering the depth and strength of the human spirit. E is for the extraordinary person that you are. F is for friends and family who love you. G is for great accomplishments in your future. H is for hope on the horizon for less pain and more gain. That's great, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Lisa, that was amazing. And thank you, Jody, Michael, Stephanie, Jean, um, and Abiona Therapeutics. Thanks for this opportunity to talk about EB. We appreciate everyone's engagement. Thank you, EBRP, for hosting us today. And I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, uh, EBRP, and thank you to our patient community. Um, we, we really loved having you with us. We'll fight this together. And thank you to Stanford for being our, our, our number one partner. Thank you all for joining us today. I will be sharing these resources from Lisa, as well as a recording of the call after the fact. Um, you can find any information on our community council on our website at evresearch.org. Thank you all for joining today. And thank you, Abiona, for sponsoring this and for celebrating EB Awareness Week with us. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.